Elon Musk with $164 billion. Uh, but after all the turmoil at his companies, uh, that made a dramatic dent in his wealth. From the small luxuries like owning some of the best cars in the world to the unbelievable ones like owning an entire town, Elon Musk has it all. The Tesla CEO has shocked the world by becoming the ultimate richest man in the world, valued at a whopping $260.8 billion. Alongside that, he has broken the record for the longest standing CEO of an automobile company which is Tesla. But when he's not busy running his companies or building a conglomerate, he indulges himself in the most luxurious lifestyle. And today, we will be looking at just what Elon Musk owns to understand the billionaire lifestyle of the richest man in the world. Elon Musk just made the most surprising purchase of all time. He and his associates acquired over 3,500 acres of land in Bastrop, Texas. The land which lies 35 miles outside Austin has been named Snailbrook, referencing the boring company's mascot. And the vision behind the land acquisition is actually a Texas utopia along the Colorado River. Elon said the land would develop into a utopian town that would feature prefabricated homes with amenities such as a pool, outdoor sports area, gym, and a charter school. But this isn't Elon's only shocking land purchase. Back in 2021, Musk announced plans for another city, Starbase, in Boca Chica, Texas, approximately 350 miles from Snailbrook. These heavy land investments and town creation projects were attempts to address the high cost of living for SpaceX and the boring company workers, especially as SpaceX employees have a significant presence in Boca Chica. However, Musk also has plans to build a private compound nearby for his residents. This proof of his extravagant lifestyle mirrors his entrepreneurial success, with indulgences ranging from designer fashion and exotic cars to private jets and lavish holidays. He made headlines last summer when he was spotted chartering the Zoo Superyacht in Mykonos, Greece. Renowned for his high-profile lifestyle and luxury travels, Musk made headlines last summer when he was spotted chartering the Zoo Superyacht in Mykonos, Greece. The yacht is a very impressive 79-foot vessel, operated by the most luxurious yacht charter company, Northrop & Johnson. Elon easily made the headlines as its sleek design and lavish amenities captivated onlookers. It boasts of four luxurious cabins accommodating up to eight guests and a modern minimalistic interior design that creates a spacious and comfortable ambiance. Its expansive outdoor deck space, sun deck with sun loungers, jacuzzi, and spacious dining area allow for the most comfortable and relaxing vacation which Elon was seen having. During his adventure, he reportedly explored the Greek islands, enjoyed its stunning scenery, and visited some local hotspots with the yacht. And the shocking thing about all this is the fact that the daily renting of the yacht alone costs a fortune of $7,171, which Elon spent in a heartbeat to have a luxurious holiday. But his lifestyle wasn't always this opulent. In fact, he wasn't even born into a rich family. Elon was born to a South African father and a Canadian mother on June 28, 1971 in Pretoria, South Africa. He first showed signs of entrepreneurship and a love for computers when he crafted a video game at the age of 12 and successfully sold it to a computer magazine. However, his environment didn't let him thrive because of the apartheid in the country. So in 1988, when he acquired a Canadian passport, Elon decided to leave South Africa. His unwillingness to endorse the apartheid through mandatory military service and his pursuit of enhanced economic prospects led him to the United States. And so, his new journey began. Elon first enrolled at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, eventually transferring to the University of Pennsylvania in 1992. There, he diligently studied and ultimately graduated with bachelor's degrees in both physics and economics in 1997. Thinking his path was in academics, he ventured into graduate studies in physics at Stanford University, California. However, in just two days, he dropped out from Stanford after just two days when he discovered he was sitting on a potential gold mine. Actually, he created this gold mine back in 1995 when he was still in university. He founded Zip2, a pioneering company that provided online newspapers with invaluable maps and business directories. The success of Zip2 was massive, and just four years later, it was acquired by the esteemed computer manufacturer Compaq. The acquisition fetched him an impressive $307 million. This was the starting point of one of Elon's biggest projects. With the ideas and newfound money he had, 
he entered the realm of online financial services, establishing X.com. This venture eventually metamorphosed into the widely recognized PayPal Today, a platform that facilitates online money transfers. And shortly after he created it, eBay acquired it for a huge sum of $1.5 billion in 2002. His billionaire lifestyle began here. One of the most beloved cars from his collection was purchased after this acquisition by eBay. His McLaren F1 was purchased for approximately $1,000,000, just after the sale of PayPal. This car became a notable part of Elon's automotive journey, and it almost cost Elon his life as well. Fortunately for him, the car merely crashed, and he and his friend Peter Thiel came out unscathed. But that mere incident changed his perspective on things, and the billionaire lifestyle took a backseat again. His quest for transformative ventures continued to grow. And this time, he dived into something entirely different. Due to his resolute belief that the survival of humanity meant becoming a multi-planet species, he founded Space Exploration Technologies aka SpaceX in 2002. Elon's vision for SpaceX was basically the development of more cost-effective rockets, and this endeavor materialized in the form of the Falcon 1 which was launched in 2006, and the larger Falcon 9 which was inaugurated four years later in 2010. These rockets were meticulously designed to substantially undercut the costs of their competitors which they did. But the major breakthrough came in 2018 with the unveiling of the Falcon Heavy. This marked a huge milestone for SpaceX, boasting a payload capacity of 117,000 pounds to orbit, which was nearly double that of its largest competitor, the Boeing company's Delta Ivro Heavy, at a fraction of the cost. Elon also revealed the Super Heavy Starship system as the potential frontier of the SpaceX company. He envisaged it as a paradigm-shifting successor of the Falcon Heavy. The system would encompass the Super Heavy first stage, capable of lifting a remarkable 100,000 kilo to 120,000 pounds, to low Earth orbit, with the Starship serving as the payload. Beyond its orbital capabilities, the Starship is also envisioned for expedited Earth city transportation and the establishment of bases on both the Moon and Mars. The inaugural test flights of the Super Heavy Starship system began in 2020, and it served as a proof of Musk's unwavering commitment to advancing space exploration. He also shows commitment to the vision of SpaceX and space exploration by taking on the role of chief designer in addition to his role as CEO. He oversaw the development of not only the Falcon rockets but also the Dragon spacecraft and the groundbreaking Starship, and in turn, SpaceX's contributions have extended beyond ambitious space exploration goals to solid contributions like the contract to construct the lunar lander for astronauts slated to return to the moon by 2025 as an integral part of nasa's artemis space program but elon wasn't only building spacex back then he took an interest in the potential of electric cars which he subsequently turned into the automobile company tesla in 2004. originally it was founded by martin eberhard and mark tarpening but it later emerged as a beacon of innovation under Musk's guidance. The transformative journey began in 2006 with the unveiling of the Roadster, an electric car that was unconventional at the time, as it embodied the characteristics of a sports car. With a remarkable range of 245 miles on a single charge and the ability to accelerate 60 miles per hour in under four seconds, the Roadster marked a huge leap in Tesla's future. But Tesla's trajectory reached great heights in 2010 when it secured approximately $226 million in funding. From then on, Musk manufactured groundbreaking models, including the highly acclaimed Model S sedan in 2012, and the luxurious Model X SUV in 2015. Notably, the Model 3, unveiled in 2017 as a more economically accessible option, surpassed all expectations and became the best-selling electric car in history. With the achievement of this huge feat, Musk picked back up his abandoned billionaire lifestyle and made a lavish purchase. Musk purchased a huge mansion in the upscale Bel Air area of Los Angeles, valued at a combined $17 million. The mansion boasts an expansive 20,428 SQFT with amenities such as a gym, seven bedrooms, tall ceilings, a wine cellar, and a swimming pool. And it was only the first of the four Bel Air mansions he purchased. His second purchase was the acquisition of a ranch house previously owned by Gene Wilder, which he turned into a private school for his children. 
In a Vogue interview, he whimsically described it as resembling a little schoolhouse on the prairie, though it was situated in the affluent Bel Air neighborhood on a golf course. The Bel Air mansion spree continued with his acquisition of two additional properties. One which was an under construction mansion purchased for $24.25 million according to Variety, and the other which was distinctive. According to a 2013 Business Insider report was valued at a combined $70 million. His diverse and opulent real estate portfolio reflects Musk's inclination to luxury living. Eventually, he put his innovative and entrepreneurial vision behind, instead, choosing to focus on running his three companies and living a life of luxury. He began to dress rich, indulging in expensive fashion unlike other famous CEOs. Unlike Steve Jobs who sought Issey Miyake's expertise to craft a discreet black turtleneck, and Mark Zuckerberg, with his iconic gray t-shirts which projected a free-spirited CEO persona, Elon Musk was different. He was less inclined to conform to these established norms of the minimalist looks of tech CEOs. Instead, he collaborated with designer Emily Don Long to revamp his wardrobe around ruggedly masculine icons like young Harrison Ford and Paul Newman. His most notable look was in 2018 at the SXSW in a vintage leather pilot's jacket and engineer boots. He sought to evoke the spirit of intergalactic exploration while discussing the necessity of colonizing Mars with that outfit. And over the years, his fashion sense has evolved. He developed a swaggering signature style, and he is believed to no longer work with a stylist. A recent sighting in April showed Musk in a video at a SpaceX facility, where the wind billowed his oversized graphic t-shirt around his tapered black jeans. But fashion isn't the only thing Musk has a passion for. His fervor for automobiles is also evident in his collection of exotic and high-performance vehicles, which have most of the world's most prestigious automobile brands. One notable car in his collection is the Jaguar 1967 E-Type, which is a classic convertible. And although Musk's experience with this particular Jaguar has been less than ideal, it is a notable part of his automotive collection. In addition to it, he has a fleet of everyday cars that scream luxury. The Audi Q7, Porsche 911, and BMW M5 sports car have a spot in his garage, which showcases his appreciation for performance and versatility in his choice of vehicles. But as the owner of Tesla, Musk's electric car collection extends beyond conventional cars. He is the owner of the Lotus Esprit submarine car used in the movie, The Spy Who Loved Me, which was acquired at an auction for $920,000. However, his innovative ideas and entrepreneurship spirit kicked in again when he made his plans to acquire Twitter public in April 2022. But way before he made his plans public, he had been a part of the company from the sidelines. He joined the social media platform in 2009, swiftly amassing a substantial following which exceeded 85 million by 2022 under the username Elon Musk. But his acquisition plan of Twitter was very difficult to actualize, especially because of the many controversies he created on the app. In August 2018 he made a series of tweets proposing the privatization of Tesla at $420 per share, with claims of having secured funding. This led to legal repercussions as the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, filed a securities fraud lawsuit against Musk, stating that the tweets were misleading. And despite the initial resistance from Tesla's board, Musk eventually had to reach a settlement that included relinquishing his chairman role for three years, pre-approval of his tweets by Tesla lawyers, and fines that totaled $20 million. Beyond personal controversies, Musk extended his engagement with Twitter by criticizing their policies regarding the principles of free speech, particularly because of their content moderation policies. By April 2022, his involvement moved from mere tweets to the acquisition of over 9% of Twitter's shares. This move was a bid to acquire the entire company, initially valued at $44 billion and later revised to $54.20 per share. Twitter's board surprisingly accepted Musk's bid envisioning him as the sole owner. And Musk wasn't quiet about it. He made ambitious plans for the platform, stating his intentions to enhance it with new features, make algorithms open source for increased trust, combat spam bots, and authenticate all users. But his plans were short-lived, because by July 2022, Musk opted to withdraw his bid, citing inadequate information on bot accounts, and stating that Twitter was in material breach of multiple provisions of the purchase agreement. A legal battle ensued, 
which led to Twitter's shareholders voting to accept Musk's offer in September 2022. Thus, he became the new CEO in October 2022. He wasted no time implementing significant changes as Twitter's owner. His initial actions were substantial layoffs, the introduction of a subscription service allowing users to purchase blue checkmark verification for $8 monthly, and the dissolution of Twitter's content moderation body. He even reinstated several banned accounts, including that of former U.S. President Donald Trump. But unlike his other companies which were on the rise because of his investments and decisions, Twitter faced challenges. The advertising revenue dropped significantly because companies were not in support of Musk's ownership, so they withdrew ads in response. But Musk remained undeterred and redefined the platform by renaming it from Twitter to X in July 2023. Despite his plans, he has not been able to do much since he became CEO due to the series of controversies that he is currently navigating. He has a potential $1 billion penalty related to his earlier withdrawal from a $44 billion bid to acquire Twitter. Additionally, he faces allegations of an affair with Nicole Shanahan, wife of Sergey Brin, his longtime friend and co-founder of Google. Furthermore, news emerged that Musk secretly fathered twins with Siobhan Zillis, an executive at Tesla. And all this happened within the past 30 days. Musk is also being accused of fostering a toxic culture of racism and sexism within the companies he leads. On June 15th, both former and current black employees at Tesla filed a lawsuit alleging racial discrimination. This came after Musk paid $250,000 to settle a sexual misconduct claim against him in 2018 from a SpaceX employee. Despite these scandals, he has managed to remain CEO to all his companies except Twitter, which he voluntarily resigned from in June 2023. Since then, Elon Musk has reclined into his comfort and allowed only exclusive access to himself, as opposed to his initial free access persona. Most recently, Musk confirmed that he would be attending a gathering organized by Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney's right-wing political party in Rome. Musk also reportedly accepted the invitation to be a guest at the Atreju Festival, which is a four-day event, also organized by Maloney's people. This exclusive access has also made Musk meet more famous people who have in turn gifted him some of the most expensive things. Renowned celebrity jeweler Ben Baller recently created a unique diamond ring adorned with Tesla's name and logo as a gift for Musk. In an Instagram post, Baller expressed his admiration for Musk's inspirational role and credited him with motivating both himself and his friend Paul, who also owns a Tesla Model X P100D. This custom-made Tesla ring, valued at $37,000 according to Baller, marks the first ever instance of the jeweler gifting a personalized piece to anyone. In his Instagram message, Balor also stated the significance of the gift. He attributed it to Musk's role in inspiring people to elevate their endeavors and push boundaries. Also, the gift was to commend Musk for his contributions to the American job market, with him providing nearly 50,000 jobs and re-establishing America as a strong player in the automobile industry. In addition to his indulgence of luxury jewelry, he travels lavishly. Musk travels in only his private jets, which can afford him the level of comfort and luxury he needs. His private jet fleet is huge and comprises two Gulfstream models registered at Falcon Landing, an LLC associated with SpaceX and Tesla. The Gulfstream G5550, which is his latest addition, has a passenger capacity of 17, but has been customized for a sleeping configuration. But the G650, which is one of the other aircrafts in his fleet, boasts of a larger size and flies faster, which makes it Musk's favorite jet for his journeys from California to Texas. His private jet preference for travel underscores his commitment to the luxurious and billionaire lifestyle. During his travels, he pampers himself even more by opting for stays in only five-star hotels. These accommodations, which are renowned for their impeccable service, top-notch amenities, and exquisite lodgings, always provide him with a haven of comfort and extravagance in whatever place he journeys to. He only makes exceptions on extremely hectic days to take on unconventional sleeping arrangements like resting on the floor in the conference room or on a couch at his factory. Asides those days, his overall lifestyle reflects hard work, opulence, and luxury in the best ways possible. That electricity is going to be extremely high. Are you optimistic about the global economy or pessimistic? Pessimistic. The official policy of China is uh, that Taiwan should be integrated. 
One does not need to read between the lines. One can simply read the lines. Even assuming the, the sort of current economy, economic usage, electricity per capita being uh, constant, you're looking at roughly a tripling of electricity demand. If you say, like, there's really only one thing that matters from an environmental standpoint uh, for carbon, which is that we are taking uh, billions, eventually trillions of tons of carbon from very deep with it under the earth and putting, transferring it to the atmosphere and oceans. That's the, that's actually really all that matters is taking vast amounts of carbon from underground where it's buried and moving it into the atmosphere by burning it. And if you do that for long enough, eventually you will get to climate change. The Chinese economy and, and the global, the rest of the global economy are like conjoined twins. Uh, it, it would be like trying to separate conjoined twins. That That's the severity of the situation. I'm simply saying that that is their policy, and I think you should take their word seriously. We've had a government, I'm talking about the U.S. now, that in 2000 made an $8 trillion deficit. And today we have a $33 trillion deficit. So the deficit's grown by more than a trillion dollars each year over the last 23 years. That is highly inflationary. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve um, is highly inflationary. And so, all these different measures um, are much more structural, much more difficult. So as a result of that, interest rates are going to remain higher. Opportunities for investors are going to be able to be very patient. Um, you could do nothing and enjoy a positive return. In anything that is a product or a service where there's not artificial uh, scarcity created, such as like, I want to live exactly in you know, neighborhood houses. It's like, okay, well, there's only 100 houses there. So, you know, that, that would still have scarcity. Um, or a unique artwork would have scarcity. But anything that does not have scarcity that we, def that we deliberately designed to be scarce will be plentiful for everyone. If you just do the rough back the envelope uh, math, um, you need to roughly triple electricity um, to get to a equally electric economy. Um, you know, roughly, a third of power is electric, and then, uh, you know, rough, these are very rough numbers. Roughly a third is spent in transportation um, of various kinds uh, with, with uh, fossil fuels or hydrocarbons, um, and then roughly a third is heating. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but every economist in the world now is now saying it's a soft land landing and it looks like we've avoided a recession, which all leads me to believe we are absolutely headed for a recession. Um, it's going to happen, I think, in the first half of next year, and it's two primary drivers. There's a lot of little ones, but I mean, there's a bunch of little ones. Student loan repayments are about to begin again, which puts a drag on people. Um, uh, debt, uh, your, I mean, the interest rates uh, acceleration here, 525 basis point acceleration in interest rates really hasn't been felt in the economy. Mm -hmm. And every month, more and more people have to refinance their house and ha are wake up to a mortgage rate that's uh, mortgage interest payment that's 40% higher than it was. There is fundamentally an issue that's coming to a head with Taiwan, and it's unclear when exactly push will come to shove, but it seems that there's a good chance push will come to shove. It's trending in that direction. Um, I dread to think what would, what they would happen. The results would be for the global economy would be absolutely catastrophic. But um, you know, China has been very clear about its goals on China and uh, sort of um, including Taiwan um, as, as part of China. So one does not need to read between the lines. One can simply read the lines. They are very clear. You have a political, you have a monetary, you have an, a, a conflict type of environment. At the same time, you have the greatest inventiveness. We talk about this fabulous technology development that has so much potential right. to um, produce wonderful things, and then at the also it, it's a, it could be a problem. So if you take the time horizon, the monetary policies that we're going to see and so on will have greater effects on the world. And you look at the world gaps, so you can, it's difficult to be optimistic on that. Well, there's even more that comes out of China. Um, so. China is a lot, so much of, of the world's um, heavy lifting on manufacturing, especially if ma the manufacturing is, you know, simply hard work and, and say not, not particularly glamorous. Um, China just does an immense amount of hard work. 
um, that people, most people have no idea how much hard work they do. If effectively a recession is kind of you roll the dice and a six comes up, it's a recession for 12 or 24 months. And you, some people would argue recession is healthy. We've been rolling the die 15 times and it's never come up six. We're just due. We're just due. And it looks as if a lot of different things are going to potentially dampen the economy and that we'll have two quarters straight of negative GDP growth and then the other things. China and the rest of the world being conjoined twins from an economic standpoint will mean that the separation is going to be dire indeed. That happens. I hope it does not happen. And there's no easy solution here. But if there's any, if there's any path to a diplomatic uh, solution, uh, we should really uh, take that seriously. But the other stuff, it's anecdotal. I was at this conference yesterday, the Nordic Business Forum. Hmm. I was just speaking to a lot of different businesses. And you can tell things are starting to feel a little wobbly. And even... You know, even weird stuff. I travel a lot. For the first time, I'm starting to see these crazy prices start to come down. So it just feels to me like the economy is starting to grind a little bit and starting to slow down. And I think when we wake up in six months and another 10 or 20 percent of households have had to refinance their mortgage at much higher rates. But it is a tremendous amount of hard work, uh, as everyone here knows, uh, to actually uh, put that generation in place um, and then transport it to where, where it gets used uh, and then dealing with the, the, the peaks and then taking advantage of the valleys of power production. And then all these, I, I just, I, it strikes me we are due and uh, I would bet it's first half of next year. But you know what? The great thing about recessions is they always happen at and the great thing about them is that they always end. So are you expecting a hard landing or a soft landing in the United States or you just can't project? I would, I do not, we will not see a hard or a soft landing in 2024. Um, the amount of fiscal stimulus that is just entering the economy, which is very inflationary. The CHIPS Act, the IRA and the Infrastructure Act, about $970 billion. The largest peacetime non-pandemic moment of fiscal stimulus. At the same time, our central bank is trying to arrest the economy. And there was a recession and he got fed up and turned it back to the bank you could move in and buy it for, for at a great rate. The bottom line is catastrophe or economic strain, not even catastrophe, is a rebalancing of power from the old to the young. And we've decided that if 1.2 million people die, that would be bad, i.e. the pandemic. But if the NASDAQ went down, that would be tragic. So we're gonna spend trillions of dollars propping up boomers and capital. Well, there's, I mean, there's fundamentally um, three, three pillars uh, to a sustainable energy future. Um, what, you know, one is sustainable energy generation, which is uh, solar, wind, um, hydro. I'm actually, you know, a, a fan of, of nuclear. Basically, it, it, any electricity where you could say, okay, this is not going to meaningfully change the chemistry of the climate and oceans, you know, the atmospheric oceans. And so, um, anyway, so you've got sustainable electricity generation on one side, then you've got um, stationary batteries as the third pillar, second pillar, uh, which uh, is needed for any kind of intermittent uh, electricity production. And by its nature, uh, solar and wind are intermittent. Um, so batteries and solar and wind go together extremely well. Um, and, uh, and then the third pillar is electric transport. Even if you take all of the, like, all the steam engines and everything and divide that by total number of humans, um, power usage per human uh, thermal, electrical, or otherwise, um, was a minuscule 200 years ago, and even less uh, 300 years ago. Now it is uh, incredibly high, um, and it is rising. Um, and, and this is, and, and you're going to see, I think, a lot of electricity usage by um, the sort of neural net uh, data centers as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. the heavy power draws. Um, in fact, I think one of the scaling constraints for AI is going to be power availability. Um, they're, they're quite power hungry. So you've got, you've got um, basically uh, average energy usage uh, per person increasing dramatically um, and a transition from uh, burning hydrocarbons to things that are more sustainable. Anyway, the point is, uh, is it's going to be 3x uh, current. Um, and I think that 3x number is probably, probably happens around 2045.
application. So this is the thing about exponential uh, growth is it, it really is counterintuitive. We, we've actually gotten very good support in China. Uh, Tesla has the only uh, fully foreign-owned car factory in China. Mm -hmm. um, and we do very well in the domestic market in China. Um, and our, our, you know, our Shanghai factory is our highest performing factory globally. So it's a, it's a very impressive team that Tesla has in China. And, mm -hmm. um, the work ethic there is incredible. Um, you know, we are entering a phase where the U.S. Will, will not be the biggest economy in the world. Um, and, and there's nobody alive today who can remember when the United States was not the biggest economy in the world. So it, it is a, it's going to be a little um, probably discomforting at first uh, to, to a lot of people to have uh, China be probably you know, two or three times the size of the U.S. economy. China is actually, of any large country, the most forward-leaning uh, with sustainable energy. Um, so they have massive solar projects, wind projects, and um, have done the most with respect to electric vehicles of any uh, large country. Of, of, of smaller countries, Norway is uh, the leader, but um, for any larger, very large economy, it's, uh, China is by far the most uh, forward-leaning for sustainability. Well, I mean, the, the aspiration with these various things is to maximize the probability that the future is good for civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, the future is just a set of probabilities. Like we don't know, you know, for sure what's going to happen. I think uh, as long as American consumers uh, hang tough and continue to do their part, uh, continue to spend, I, I think the American economy can, will continue to move forward. And, you know, all the factors that you consider when considering consumer spending look pretty good. Uh, lots of jobs, you mentioned the 4% sub 4% unemployment rate, uh, real, uh, wage uh, growth is now stronger than the rate of inflation because of the throttling back of inflation. I, I speak as someone who is very much, very much an environmentalist. I believe in having, building a sustainable future for the world. I think that there are very few people who, as an individual, who have done more than I have for, to help the environment with electric cars and solar and batteries to create a sustainable energy future because we absolutely need a sustainable energy future. But there is an aspect of the environmental movement that I think has gone too far. Really said from you? Yes, so said from me, I think I am objectively one of the world's leading environmentalists in terms of doing things. I not say so. Like I'm an environmentalist who does things I'm of talk, of action, not talk, I act. So, so I feel I can say as as an environmentalist, that the environmentalist movement has gone too far. And in that, if you, in the natural extension of the environmentalist movement, if you go too far, you start to look at humanity as a bad thing. You start to look at humanity as though we are a plague on the surface of the earth, as though humanity is a bad thing. And in fact, there are some people who think and, and say explicitly that, in fact, there was on the fr front page of the New York Times, there was a guy who said, there are 8 billion people on earth, it would be better if there were none, which is crazy. Now, I think the climate change alarm is a little somewhat overblown in the short term. It's still a concern in the long term, but I think it's exaggerated in the short term. Great. Now, I have to try to thread the, the needle here between what, like what is pragmatic and what is sensible, what really matters and what doesn't matter. What really matters is that over the long term, over the course of the next several decades, that we gradually reduce how many millions and billions of tons of carbon that we move from underground and to the atmosphere because we're running sort of a climate experiment that is dangerous. But I also don't think that I think of it as a fundamental civilizational risk. It, it is, it's not going to destroy life on Earth. It's not going to destroy humanity, but it will create hardship if you change the climate o over many decades. So it's, I think my, my, my message is like, I think much more pragmatic and I think correct and sensible. And I, and I don't think we should demonize oil and gas. I think we should say, look, that is obviously necessary in the short term and the medium term too. And it'll take several decades to become sustainable. So I think if we just, without getting too worried about it, seek to have a sustainable energy future gradually, then that's what will happen. And so but I think that some of the environmentalist movement has is part of what is causing people to lose hope in the future. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we should have hope in the future. We should be excited about the future and we should build the future we want. A lot of things that we take for granted here in the United States that don't even exist in Canada. There's not no constitutional right to freedom of speech in Canada. I think that's outrageous.
Yeah, no, I, we, we, I'm not going to vote for some pro-censorship -cens candidate. Elon Musk's provocative declaration sparks a contentious debate about the true cost of unrestrained expression in the digital age. Old Twitter was fundamentally controlled by the far left. It was, like, completely controlled by the, the, the far left. I'm saying what I, what, what I care about is the, the reality of goodness, not the perception of it. And what I see all over the place is people who care about looking good while doing evil. As Elon Musk delves into the influence of advertisers on social media, questions arise about the extent to which corporate interests shape online discourse. I hope they stop. You hope? Uh, don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise? No. What do you mean? If, if somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go yourself. But go yourself. Is that clear? I hope it is. Hey, Bob, if you're in the audience. So, I mean, from the standpoint of, of the, some of the people who used to be at Twitter, uh, the people were like, well, it's a, a big shift to the right. That is correct. It is a shift to the right because everything is to the right if you're far left. Everything is to the right. But it's but how many far left people have actually been suspended or, or banned from, from Twitter now X? Zero. I did subsequently clarify it in replies, uh, but those clarifications were ignored by the media. Um, and essentially, I handed a loaded gun to those who hate me, um, and arguably to those who are anti-Semitic. Uh, to and for that, uh, I'm quite sorry. I, that that is not uh, that was not my intention. Ideological polarization on social platforms prompts individuals to seek out echo chambers that reinforce their beliefs, exacerbating societal divisions. So it's really just moved to the center, but from the perspective of the far left, it is it's moved to the right. So like everything's relative. The 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 difference in and, moderation. And, uh, sorry, I should say it, has pro it propagated that far left philosophy not just to America but to everywhere on Earth. So we'll, we'll both make our cases, right? And we'll see what the outcome is. What are the economics of that for you? I mean, you you have enormous resources, so you can actually keep this company going for a very long time. Would you keep it going for a long time if there was no advertising? I mean, if a company fails because of an advertised boycott, it will fail because of an advertised boycott. And that will be what bankrupts the company, and that's what all, everybody on Earth will know. What do you think, then, of the... I, I guess, this goes we'll back to the idea exist. of trust, though. Then and it'll I, be gone. And it'll be gone because of an advertised boycott. Despite attempts to clarify his remarks, Elon Musk's words become fodder for media sensationalism, fueling controversy and misinterpretation. There was... There was uh, basically oppression of um, any any views that would even, I would say, could be considered middle of the road. Um, but certainly anything on the, the right, I'm not talking about like like far right, I'm just talking mildly right. The people, like Republicans were suppressed at 10 times the rate of Democrats. The New York They're Times company and the New York Times uh, newspaper, it appeared over the summer uh, to be throttled. What, what did? The New York Times. Uh, well, we, we do require that um, that everyone has to buy a subscription and we don't make exceptions for anyone. And, and I think if I want the New York Times, I have to pay for a subscription and they don't give me a free subscription. So I'm not going to give them a free subscription. But were you but were you throttling the New York Times relative to other news organizations, relative to everybody else? Was it was it was it specific to the to the Times? It, they didn't buy a subscription. Oh, by the way, it only costs like a thousand dollars a month. So, if they just do that, then then they they're back in back in the saddle. But 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 you are so, saying that it was throttled. You know, I'm saying. Do you, I mean, was there a conversation that you had with somebody? You said, look, you know, un I'm unhappy with the Times. They should either be buying the subscription, or I don't like their content, or whatever. Whatever. Any organization that refuses to buy a subscription uh, is 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 not going to be recommended. But then what does that say about free speech? And what does well, that say about like th amplifying free speech certain, certain exactly voices? Free. It costs a little bit. Right, but that, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. But that's an interesting... You know, it's like, it's like in uh, South Park uh, right. where they say, you know, 
freedom isn't free, it costs a buck or five or whatever. Um, um, so, but it's pretty cheap, okay? Um, it's low cost, low cost freedom. The global reach of propaganda underscores its pervasive influence in shaping narratives and ideologies across borders. How do you square the support that you have given? Uh, I believe you were at a fundraiser uh, for uh, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, for example, who says that yeah. the climate, uh, climate issue uh, is a hoax, right? Yeah, I disagree with him on that. I, but I would think that that would be such a singular issue for you. I would think that, that the climate issue would be such a singular issue for you that actually it would disqualify almost anybody who, who didn't take that issue seriously. Well, I haven't endorsed anyone for, for president. I mean, I wanted to hear what Vivek had to say because um, I think some of his things are, that's some of the things he says, I think are pretty solid. Um, you know, he's concerned about government overreach, um, about government control of information. The, I mean, the, the, the degree to which uh, old Twitter was basically a sock puppet of the government was ridiculous. Um, so, you know, it, it seems to me that there's, that there's a, a very severe violation of the First Amendment um, in terms of how much the government control, uh, how, how much control the government had over old Twitter. Um, and uh, it no longer does. So, you know, there's a reason for the First Amendment. Um, the reason for the First Amendment for freedom of speech is because the, the people that immigrated to this country uh, came from places where there was not freedom of speech. And and they were like, you know what, we we, we got to make sure that that's constitutional. Um, because where they came from, if they said something, they'd be put in prison. Or they'd be, uh, you know, something bad would happen to them. So, uh, and freedom of speech, you have to say, when is it relevant? It's only relevant when, when someone you don't like can say something you don't like. Or it, ha it has no meaning. Um, and, and, and as soon as you sort of, you know, throw in the towel and concede to censorship, it is only a matter of time before someone censors you. And that is why we have the First Amendment. Elon Musk's warning about the influence of advertiser revenue on social media platforms raises concerns about the integrity of online free speech. That's why I say, like, you know, like San Francisco Berkeley is a niche ideology. It's hard to say, like, is there a place that's more far left than San Francisco Berkeley? Maybe Portland. Maybe Portland. But it's like, it's a... Right there. It's yeah, it's like, it's Coldwell. those two places are the, the most far left places uh, in America. Yes. Um, so f uh, from their standpoint, everything is to the right, <laughs> including moderates. Right, right. So but now, if, 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 if you internalize a far left position, you... Uh, Everything seems wrong to you that is that is not far left, right? And so they naturally oppressed any anything that didn't agree with their views. That's why I say that it was an accidental far left information weapon. So, uh, it's, it, 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 because it's, it's like Silicon Valley attracts the smartest engineers, the smartest sort of technologists and programmers from around the world. Um, they created an information weapon that was then harnessed by the far left, who could not themselves create the weapon, but happened to be co-located where the technologists were. That they didn't feel comfortable on the platform. And I, I, wonder, I just wonder and ask you and think about that for a Tell second. Tell it to the judge. But the, but the judge is going to be... Uh, the judge is the public. And you think that the public is going to say that, that Disney is making a mistake? Yes. And they're going to boycott Disney? They already are. Well, there, there are some that are for, for, for lots of different reasons. But you think that this is going to, that you have the, this goes to actually the interesting of, of, of power and leverage. Let the chips fall where they may. Let the chips fall where they may. The suppression of moderate viewpoints highlights a troubling trend toward ideological extremism, hindering constructive dialogue. The technologists uh, generally are moderate, maybe moderate left, but they're they're not they're, they're they're not far left. That's why I say San Francisco, Berkeley. It's, it's it doesn't even extend to South San Francisco or even to Palo Alto. So so SF Berkeley is the most far left. Um, perhaps you know in a competition with Portland, but I'd say SF Berkeley is more far left even than Portland. But like literally in America, it's we're talking about an area that's maybe 
a 10 mile radius. And so the, the normally the the effects, the negative effects of a far left ideology that is would be geographically limited to a to 10 mile radius. That's like not it's small like the, so so any any bad effects of that ideology would be geographically constrained under normal circumstances and have been in the past. But when you have uh, basically a technolo- technological megaphone, which, w- which was Twitter and, and social media in general, suddenly you, the, the far left are handed a megaphone to earth. A, a, a te- a, a, an incredibly powerful technology weapon that they themselves could not create, but they happen to be co-located with the technologists who created it by accident. Elon Musk criticizes the monopolistic control exerted by tech giants, highlighting the erosion of free speech rights in the digital realm. That's how I feel. Don't but advertise. How do you think then about the economics of, of X? If, 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 if part of the underlying model, at least today, and maybe it needs to shift, maybe the answer is it needs to shift away from advertising. Um, if, if you believe that this is the one part of your business where you will be beholden to those who uh, have this view, G- what do you do? F Y. I, I understand that, but there's a reality too, <laughs> right? Yes. No. No. I, I, I mean, Linda no, Yaccarino is right here, and she's uh, got to sell uh, advertising. Uh, absolutely. So, um, no. No. Totally. So. So. No. No. Actually, what what this advertising boycott is uh, is is going to do? It's it's going to company. And you think that the company- I, I, but, and the whole world will know that those advertisers company, and we will document it in great detail. But there are those advertisers. I imagine are going to say they're going to say we didn't the company. Oh yeah. They're going to say tell to tell to Earth. But they're going to say that they're going to say Elon that you company because you said these things and that they were inappropriate things and that they didn't feel comfortable on the platform. Right. That's, that's what and, they're and going to say. And let's see how Earth responds to that. Elon delves into the intricate mechanisms driving online censorship, shedding light on the creation of information warfare. Could you see yourself voting for President Biden? If, if it's if it's a Biden Trump election, for example? I think I would not vote for Biden. <laughs> You'd vote for Trump. I'm not saying I'd vote for Trump, but I mean <sighs> This is definitely a difficult choice here, yeah, you know. Would, <laughs> would, you, uh, would you vote for Nikki Haley? Nikki Haley, by the way, wants uh, all social media um, names to be exposed, as you know. No, like I said, I mean, I think these, you have to, you have to, you know, consider that there is a lot of wisdom uh, in these amendments. And, and there's no Miranda rights in Canada. People like think like, you know, you have the right to remain silent. You don't actually in Canada. Um, so, you know, I'm half Canadian, I can you know, say these things off both. Um, but, you know, so, so like, you, you just got, you, you, the freedom of speech is incredibly important. Um, even when people, and, and like, like I said, it's, it's, it's actually especially important. In fact, it is only relevant when uh, people you don't like can say things you don't like. Elon's call to hold corporations accountable through consumer activism signals a growing awareness of the power of collective action in shaping digital discourse. I mean, look, the, the, the joke I used to make about old Twitter was it was like giving everyone in the psych ward a megaphone. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that things can get promoted uh, that are negative beyond the sort of circle of, of somebody simply screaming crazy things in Times Square, which happens all the time. Um, you know, so, so the, it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's pretty rare for something, um, frankly, that is, uh, hateful to be promoted. It's not, it's not, it's not that it never happens, um, but it's, it's fairly rare. Um, I mean, I would encourage people to look at, for those that use the system, when you look at the, the sort of, the, the feed that you receive, uh, how, how often is it, is it hateful? And over time, has it gotten more or less hateful? And I would say that if you look at uh, the X platform today, 
versus a year ago, I think it is actually much better. Biden or an American energy has sent prices soaring and his latest actions will make it catastrophically worse. It's going to be bad at a level that we've never seen. This will be so bad. If we don't have anything that ties us together, when that day comes, and you know what I mean, when the economic crisis comes, because it's coming, like what's that gonna look like? It's gonna be very scary. Trump issues a chilling proclamation, vowing to thwart any attempts to rig the upcoming presidential election in 2024, echoing fears of electoral manipulation. Our public obsessions are getting increasingly irrelevant, actually. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, it's like crazy. A ton more than that statement of financial condition, and she doesn't know how to get out of it because her politics won't allow her. She calls him a bully. She says he's going to bring out racial slurs. He's going to say things today and taunt her. Well, Miss James, you taunted him. Before you came into office, before you saw one record, one statement of financial condition. Elon delivers a sobering message, emphasizing the imperative of nurturing the next generation by encouraging childbirth and fostering a new era of human evolution. And I, I think that perhaps my biggest advice to leaders, to government leaders and to, to the people in general would be to make sure to have children to create the new generation. And I think any incentives that can be done to incent the new generation, to make it easier for women to have children and to support the children, I think would be very wise. Revelations of corruption within the Biden family emerge, with Hunter Biden allegedly leveraging his father's influence to extract cash, exposing a web of deceit and exploitation. Bobolensky met with Joe Biden twice, confirmed he was the big guy who called the shots. Joe Biden was for sale. The family desperately needed cash. Hunter shook them down with his dad in the room, got the cash, and then cut Tony out. Shocking allegations surface implicating the Biden family in dubious Russian energy deals, raising concerns about clandestine dealings and potential national security implications. It wasn't just China. The Biden family was tangled up with the Russians. We know about the Russian billionaire who had dinner with Joe and Hunter, wired him millions, and then left Biden off the sanctions list. But it was much bigger than that. The Biden family was brokering Russia-Chinese energy deals right under the FBI's noses. Trump advocates for energy affordability and independence, stressing the importance of securing America's energy future amidst global uncertainties. If America is going to dominate the world in manufacturing once again, as it did when I was running things, you remember when they used to say, you can't have manufacturing jobs in our country anymore? I said, really, why? And we created hundreds of thousands of them. But we must be the most affordable energy and electricity place anywhere on the planet. We have to have affordable energy. Right now, we have energy that's weak, substandard, and unaffordable. It's made by the wind. The windmills rust, they rot, they kill the birds. It's the most expensive energy there is. And we have other things that are also no good. It's called the Green New Deal. I call it the Green New Hoax. One of the reasons manufacturing jobs were flooding back into the United States when I was president was that we dramatically reduced energy costs. Sadly, crooked Joe Biden sacrificed this tremendous economic advantage on the altar of the Green New Deal, perhaps because he was bribed by communist China or because communist China knows all of the money that they've paid him. We have a Manchurian candidate. That's what he is. He's a Manchurian candidate. They know everything about him and he's scared stiff. He won't do a thing. I took in hundreds of billions of dollars from China and Joe Biden's afraid to even talk to him. Under Biden's newly proposed power plant regulations, most natural gas and coal plants will be forced to shut down. By the way, they tried that in Germany, and now they're going back and building coal plants all over the place because they've destroyed Germany. They have no energy. So Germany now is building a coal plant every two weeks. And China is building a coal plant every week, every single week, they're putting up a new coal plant. Biden's identity politics come under scrutiny with Trump mocking his purported ethnic and religious affiliations, questioning the authenticity of his public persona. For 364 days of the year, Joe Biden goes around Washington telling everybody he's a Puerto Rican truck driving Jewish professor who was raised in a black church. But once a year, every year, Biden taps into his roots, 
He's an Irishman. There's no holiday the president loves more than St. Patrick's Day. It's the one day of the year he doesn't have to pretend. He just tells folk tales from the old country. Biden's nepotism scandal deepens as allegations surface of using burner phones and aliases to conceal illicit dealings, casting a shadow over the integrity of the presidency. Fannie charged Trump with RICO in Georgia AOC. So if RICO's not a I guess Trump's fine. But honestly, Biden flies his son around the world to cut deals, invites his son's partners to the White House, has phone calls and meetings with them, drops sanctions on them, greases regs for them, gets their kids into colleges, and he gets his entire extended family from sons, brothers to grandkids paid millions? Cars, cash, diamonds, expensive scotch? And he uses an alias? Joe Biden uses an alias. They use burner phones to talk. Biden's donors paid his family's back taxes. Could Don Jr. stiff the IRS and his dad's donors square it up before an election? Come on. Investigators have delivered eyewitness testimony, bank records, mountains of circumstantial evidence, plus motive, physical evidence, digital communications, photographs, voicemails. The looming energy crisis intensifies as Biden's policies shutter power plants, leaving America vulnerable and dependent on foreign sources for its energy needs. And we're playing games with the wind. This is terrible what's happening to our country. There is nothing to replace our energy at this time, not even close. It's very expensive and it's very weak. It doesn't have the power to power up those big plants that you see. At the same time as Biden is shutting down existing power plants, he also wants to force hundreds of millions of Americans into ultra expensive electric vehicles. It costs twice as much as what you have. And what you have is better and it goes a lot longer. And it's a lot easier to fill up and we have liquid gold under our feet at a level that no other country has. But they'll strain the grid to the breaking point. It already is at a breaking point. If you look at California, it's got brownouts and blackouts every single day. People can't turn on their air conditioners. And it'll drive electricity prices into the stratosphere. If Biden's policies go forward, our electricity costs will be the highest on Earth. They're already very close with shortages, blackouts, and crippling inflation. Legal turmoil ensues in the wake of the Fonnie Willis scandal, with Democrats facing an ultimatum from the judiciary amidst mounting evidence of malfeasance. The president's always felt the luck of the Irish. His whole career, he's failed up. But today wasn't his lucky day. A judge gave Democrats the sweetest ultimatum after a scandal rocked one of their biggest cases. Either DA Fannie Willis steps down, jeopardizing the whole Trump case in Georgia, or lover boy Nathan Wade steps down and the case goes on. What do you think happened? Lover boy packed his bags. The Biden campaign may think this is a victory, but it's not. Tucker Carlson sheds light on the plight of illegal immigrants, painting a grim picture of uncertainty and apprehension as they navigate the complexities of migration. What does the majority of the country have in common with one another? Because look, if it, 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 the arc of the last century's his, American history is super, super interesting. So you have this massive influx of immigration, you know, the Ellis Island generation, late uh, 18th, or, 19th, early 20th century. And it's both good and bad. We only remember the good, but there was a lot of social volatility, like a lot. Like the mayor of Chicago got in his house, it was on Wall Street, like the whole, the Wobblies, the anarchists, like the foot soldiers that were, were immigrants, working class European immigrants. And part of the problem was there was just a lot of immigrants and I mean, Sacco and Vanzetti, you know, who the, the clerk in, uh, is it Brockton, Mass? Anyway, it was in Mass outside Boston. They'd been in the country for just a few years and they immediately got sucked into radical politics. Well, why was that? Well, because they weren't kind of bought in or rooted in or hadn't been fully assimilated into American society. So then you have the first world and we basically shut down immigration and we have this period of settling. where like all Americans, let's, th let's think through our civic religion, what ties us together. And then that leads into October of 29 and you do have this national crisis last for more than a decade and we didn't. And we had a successful, you know, the CCC, we like had these big programs, which I'll say this as a conservative, kind of worked in keeping people fed and focused, it gave them purpose, kept the country from, from collapsing during the Great Depression. So, said for me, I think 
I am objectively one of the world's leading environmentalists in terms of doing things. I not see so. Like I, I'm an environmentalist who does things. I'm of talk, of action, not talk. I act. So, so I feel I can say, as as an environmentalist, that the environmentalist movement has gone too far. And in that, if you in the natural extension of the environmentalist movement, if you go too far, you start to look at humanity as a bad thing. You start to look at humanity as though we are a plague on the surface of the earth. As though humanity is a bad thing, and in fact, there are some people who think and and say explicitly that, in fact, there was on the fr front page of the New York Times there was a guy who said there are eight billion people on Earth. It would be better if there were none, which is crazy. Hey, what we're going to do? Number one, we'll have a lot of cash, but that doesn't mean he can take it. I mean, you know what he did? I think he looked at my cash and he said, "Well, we'll take all of his cash." This is. All coming out of the White House. This is all, everything that you see, whether it's that one or the DA. In you Biden know, in the DA's office, this? in Bragg's office, he has his top people from the DOJ working in the district attorney's office in New York. Nobody knows that. Everything is coming out. This is all election interference. They're trying to damage me so they can win another election. If I rear end your car and crease your bumper, I'm happy to jump out and say, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did that. But if I were to say invade under false tre pretenses and million people and spend a trillion of your dollars doing it, I wouldn't say a word. I would never admit that was a bad idea. I couldn't. It implicates me too profoundly. The same goes for if I say locked your kids inside for a year and their brains and prevented them from getting an education. Or if I say forced you to take a vax that didn't work, that very well might have hurt you. I could never admit that I did that. I just couldn't. Because if I admitted it, I'd have to suffer the consequences. Something very much like that is happening with, which has been in progress now for almost two years. We were told at the beginning that our support would allow you to beat Russia and keep Russia from invading the rest of Europe or something. Well, almost two years in, none of that has turned out to be true. It's not going to beat Russia. The only person who's been beaten in this is the United States. The U.S. is weaker, measurably weaker, because of our support for in this. That's just true. The verdict is in. And honest, rational people admit that, no matter what their previous position. But the Biden administration cannot admit that, and neither can the U.S. Congress. And so now there is, believe it or not, an effort in progress to get the U.S. government to send another 60 odd billion dollars to the oligarchs. In so another generation of men, this one probably in their 50s, can in a pointless on. The They're not going to win, but the U.S. Congress would like to keep this conflict going anyway. This is not something you should import from America. Please don't import the work mind virus is bad. So the, the, I mean, essentially that, to summarize maybe the work mind virus, it consists of creating very divisive identity politics. So it actually amplifies work virus, mind virus in my view, amplifies racism, amplifies, frankly, and all the isms. And wh while claiming to do the opposite, it, it actually divides people and makes them sort of hate each other. And it makes people hate themselves. And it's also anti-meritocratic. It's not like, it's not merit-based. So you want to have people succeed based on how hard they work and the talents, not who they are, whether they're man, woman, what race or gender, what, it, that stuff is all creating, it's an artificial mental civil that is created. And it's not, and let me say, it's no fun, okay? It is like woke mind virus and fun are incompatible. There's no fun in that. No joy. Woke mind Buddy. virus is all about condemning people instead of celebrating people. Like when in the woke, it just doesn't celebrate. It's all about condemning and being divisive and, and being just, I think it's just evil, frankly. So that's kind of more diabolical than what we've seen in previous generations. And it's much more effective in a committedly polite country like Canada, because you don't know that it's happening. And because a demagogue like that, or your completely bizarre cross-dressing prime minister, <laughs> it's true, prime minister blackface. Um, I, didn't, I didn't wear blackface, he did. Um, 
he, three times, thank you. Three times, and I want to thank you for your commitment to the facts. Um, the prime minister, right, the prime minister, um, there on your rights, which is on you and your children, is cloaked in the language of therapy, self-help, and compassion. You're doing this for the common good. Don't you care about the elderly? And of course, being a decent person, you care very deeply about the elderly and the weakest in your society, of course. So what you don't realize is you shuffle off to abandon another God-given right to a totalitarian government is that this is not being done on behalf of a marginalized group or the weakest among us or the elderly. They hijack the language of the gospel to crush the gospel. That's exactly what they're doing. People ask me the question, and we're going to have inexpensive energy. That's going to help us get rid of this horrible inflation. You know, he really had 38% inflation. If you look at it over his term, it's 38%. Anybody that made anything, it doesn't matter because the inflation was greater than whatever they made. We're going to get prices down. We're going to bring this country back, but we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. And we can still do it.